Hello again and welcome to another installment of Authors at Google. Uh, today we'll be welcoming uh, Jared Leonard and he'll be talking about the, his upcoming to be published book, End of Control and the Future of Content. Um, to speak a little bit about the book, uh, the, t the tough issue of control emerges again and again and the key contention point uh, within TV companies and publishers, record labels and broadcasters is how can a commercial venture that is based on so-called intellectual property thrive and prosper in an environment that seems to continuously and progressively remove control from the creators, owners, providers of the content and hands it over to the people formerly known as consumers, aka users, effectively making these users more powerful every day. The reality is that every click inadvertently makes another cause for the consumer's ever increasing rise in importance. And within all the conversations that has been had about things like commercial content versus shared content, about read-only versus read -write, uh, the read-write web, and about copyright versus fair use, the crucial question always seems to boil down to where is the control? Uh, questions such as who will control the new media, how much control do I need to run a revenue generating business? Very important questions that will be addressed today. And uh, just so that he won't be eating his words, he has offered his book free, available to be downloaded from his site, the end of, or endofcontrol.com, it's www.endofcontrol.com. Uh, and you can also learn more about his, him and his work and see his blog at mediafuturist.com. So please welcome the man, uh, the Wall Street Journal named one of the leading media futurists in the world, Jared Leonard. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, basically to give you a brief summary about what I do, I work as a futurist and of course a speaker and advisor. I wrote several books. Uh, what a futurist does is essentially pontificate about trends and where it's going. Most of my clients hire me to find out what they already know, uh, which is to give them a read on the future that sort of reminds them. Um, I wrote two books, three books pretty soon. Uh, my most popular book is The Future of Music. And it's kind of funny, actually, that the book is still being purchased. It was written in 2005. This is a bad sign for the music industry, right? People are still buying the book about the future that's four years old. But uh, it's still a very popular book. And here's some of my clients. I work with technology companies, uh, mobile companies, telecoms, publishers. And I'm focusing on the whole overlap of technology and content. Uh, which I'm sure is going to be an interesting uh, topic here for Google. So for a lot of my clients, I am creating a puzzle. That's really what I do. And uh, beyond the puzzle, I freely stand on the shoulders of many other people that I read, including my 850 Google Reader RSS feeds and so on. But these are some of the people that I read. So if you're willing to actually buy books in the old-fashioned style, you can, uh, you can do those. And so I'm looking at myself as a bit of a mixer. I'm remixing a lots of stuff that I find all over the web and basically focusing on that sort of my task is to show that to people. So I'm sure you have noticed that the global economic fabric has changed. I and mean, we're looking at a situation where everything that we thought was true just a year or two ago is now being questioned. Right? Every day seems to have worse news than this. Right? So what used to work suddenly stops working. Energy, cars, Right? We used to be number one in America, now cars are number what, 50. Everybody wants to get out of cars. The financial system, media, we used to pay for music, now we don't. Right? So these things have all changed for a drastic dominance becomes very hard to achieve. Even President Bush has found out, can't always just solve things with a war. And collaboration emerges as, a success, as an essential success paradigm and of course open systems. If you look at what's happened, Firefox, 20% of the browser market now. Symbian, which has been made open source by Nokia. Right? And of course, Apache web servers and so on. So open systems are gaining everywhere. And to be frank, of course, openness is pretty hard. Right? Most of us are not used to having that kind of openness everywhere. Transparency and openness are actually a pretty hard thing to do. So if you're looking at what's happening, we're switching from the paradigm of basically you lose, I win especially media, to this paradigm of collaboration. This is a great picture I found, by the way, on the web for some reason or the other. I just licensed it a couple of days ago. An interesting example of how I get to use content myself and then find a legal way of doing so. So in any case, so we're switching from this idea of, you know, basically you lose, I win, 
to a mutual collaboration system. And as Yoshai Benkler says, who is a real futurist and, and author, he says the next stage of human organization is collaborative projects. Um, and for a lot of us that went to traditional music, uh, I mean business school, I did not, as you can tell, I went to music school. I was a musician producer. So I was lucky there. Uh, musicians know about collaboration, right? Because unless you're a solo piano player in a lounge, you know, then you have to play with others. You have to improvise, you have to collaborate. Uh, so that's what he's saying about this. I think if we're looking at what uh, Accenture has studied last year, it was a study on how people actually collaborate. And uh, they had a study that said, okay, now lots of people agree, these are all CEOs and executives that were questioned, they agree that content companies are shifting to an open distribution model. 61% agree, which is a quite large number. And also 42% of them agree that without DRM they can sell better. Which is astonishing given that most of it is not actually there, right? So are we just talking or is there also action? What we're really seeing right now is a pattern of disruption. I'm sure you're familiar with this as Google is the main disruptor in many of those cases. We're seeing production, competition, authority, copyright, ownership disrupted. And it's basically working this way that we used to have sort of incumbent companies. Now we have empowered individuals. How a bunch of guys like Twitter disrupting what the New York Times does in a way. Right? How Google has disrupt, disrupted the entire advertising business, a bunch of guys inventing a search engine. And developing countries now are disrupting developed countries. All of the future of content and media isn't going to be here. It's going to be in Asia because we have billions of people consuming stuff that have never actually bought anything before. You know, they just purchase stuff that has never really existed there. So authorized professionals, which were you know, either academics or CEOs or business leaders, now are meeting up with professional amateurs. iStock Photo, any of you guys know iStock Photo? You can buy images for like a couple of dollars each. They're going head to head with the large image banks. In fact, they've been purchased by Getty Images for that very same reason. And of course, bloggers. Right, so I'm myself not authorized by having a PhD in journalism or something, but I still write. So this is a trend that we're seeing everywhere, this kind of disruption. And this guy, you may know as Doug Morris, the CEO of Universal Music Group, see what he has to say about disruption. He says, if he had Coke coming through the faucet in the kitchen, how much are you willing to pay for Coke in the store? That's what happened to the record business. That's, so he's saying basically the Coke has become free, and why would people buy it in the store? Well, if he had any sense, I mean, I think he has some sense, I have to, have to find that somewhere. But if he had any sense, he would say, well, why don't we just put the music in the faucet? Right? And then we can make money that way, like the water companies do. Because you don't have to have a big deal to get uh, a, a, a water connection to your house. It's included. Right? It's already there. So that logic would apply here. But I thought, talking about Dark Morris, let's talk about the, what control actually is. Defining control is obviously an important question. What does it mean? You know, in the old days, you own the customer, you control distribution, you target and hit the consumers, you fight competition. You're essentially in the military. Right? In the old days, basically controlling what you do meant you had sort of a military approach to life. You seize the customer, smash the competition, destroy the, you know, all these things were. Now we have this idea where we're saying, okay, the customer is basically down there somewhere, the consumer, they can't do a whole lot about it. For example, in the music business, you could not find record releases from a Greek artist in America. It didn't exist because it wasn't published. You couldn't get what you want at all times. You couldn't buy a DVD in America and watch it in Switzerland because of region coding. Right? That's essentially this kind of situation. So it used to be basically locked up, walled mobile phone systems, Microsoft making money by control. Basically, you could say that you would make more money if you have more control. It's as simple as that. Thus, lots of business was based on this premise, the more control, the more money, which seemed kind of logical. But now, we have this system switching from closed to open, and essentially the overriding paradigm is collaboration making more money when you don't control. 
Right? That seems sort of like an antidote to everything we've learned. I mean, if you have been to business school, that is obviously a different direction. So in the past, looking at this sort of approach, you know, we are in the control room of content. Major TV studios, publishers, record labels, you know, they basically control what people do, when they get it, how much they buy, and so on. And of course, Google is in the middle of that struggle as well. But the future basically points into a different direction, burning up the control room. The future points towards trust being the primary driver of this business. Companies that you trust. Think about who you trust as a company. Maybe Southwest Airlines or EasyJet in Europe, you know, rather than United or American, right? Maybe Google rather than Microsoft, maybe Twitter rather than CNET or CNN. Right? I mean, those things are becoming an issue. Who do you trust? Where do you put your attention? Because the attention then converts to the money. So that is the issue ultimately. A lot of companies are saying, wow, now all of a sudden I have to earn trust from these people to actually get their money, right? which is quite a different direction than we used to take things in. So I, I, part of that, what I look at in this context is a thing called broadband culture. Right? And this is interesting, especially when you go to Asia a lot. Being on broadband is a, is a huge difference than just being connected to the web on a dial-up, for example, but it's a leap. Right? We're talking about broadband culture being something that is a huge change in life. For example, in Indonesia where I work, all of a sudden, people that never even had a radio station can now access the web on their mobile phone. Right? I mean, we're talking about a whole different cup of tea of how things work there. So we're going from this idea of essentially scarcity. For example, when you buy music or you buy records or you buy DVDs or movies to this idea where everything is at somewhere. Right. Ubiquity. And of course, Kevin Kelly, who lives, I think, here in San Francisco, from the founder of Wired magazine, has talked about this for the last 10 years in a book called Out of Control, which my book sort of attaches to his book in some interesting ways, I hope. But this is what we're facing right now, ubiquity. How do we make money with ubiquity? I mean, when you think about this, you know, broadband culture, mobility and convergence, meaning, for example, the iPhone is a gaming platform, the iPhone is a phone, the iPhone is a Facebook application, it's all converging. Right? All these things are coming together. We're going to redefine privacy, authority, ownership, value, R&D, production, work, and education. Pretty much everything. The disruption of this is all happening, and especially the idea of you know, how do we actually sell and buy something? Who pays? Can it all be free or feel like free? Somebody is going to have to lubricate with economic benefits. So, this is research from uh, Seibold saying the print share of information is actually declining. And we discussed this 10 years ago. My first internet companies were like, oh, we're not going to print anymore. Right? But now it's actually happening. It took much longer, but it's actually happening. People are reading news on their mobile devices using Instapaper or other applications like this, printing less. A $52 billion industry, declining on the use of print devices and all these kinds of things. And this, of course, is a huge opportunity for a lot of people, but it's also a huge amount of disruption. If the New York Times stops printing, a lot of people will have a problem. Because they're going to have to make that shift. Not everybody likes to read on the iPhone. Not everybody has an iPhone or any mobile phone that could actually do this. So control is sort of you know, going away there as well, and this is a trend that we're seeing everywhere. But take a look at, for example, 3D printers. Anybody here know about 3D printers? Okay, those are essentially uh, printers that use computer-aided design that are able to print uh, mock-ups of products right here like a regular printer. Anything from a cup to a shoe to anything that can be molded from plastic. Even houses are now printed by huge things that print concrete based on CAD design. Absolutely mind broken now there's printers that make printers. Think about what that means. You can go to the Nike online shop, buy the design, and have your shoe printed right here at home. The different color. Of course, that doesn't work quite yet. Right? Because of the materials that Nike needs to make the shoe. It's a bit more complicated than plastic. You know? But it's coming. What does this thing mean? Imagine using a software that does this and makes it on your boss, on your on your desk, and no bigger than a microwave oven. Uh, this is what e-commerce time says about what's happening here. This is like the printing press. 
The church hated the printing press. Why is that? Because all of a sudden people were able to read the Bible that wasn't handwritten by somebody who was authorized. And even worse then, in German, French, English, Italian, not in Latin. That's exactly what we're looking at today. We're not authorized. Bloggers aren't authorized. Who approves all that stuff that we make on the web? There's no official procedure for this. Now here's Google, of course, playing in this turf. And I think one of Google's challenges is to guide the content creators and the owners into this new world. Right? Because they don't know what the hell is going on. Right? They're seeing all this stuff happening with their content, no matter what it is, whether it's news, or books, or films, or television, or music. They have to be guided into this new way of doing things, and it's a tough mission. Because I do a lot of that work myself, I would sympathize with Google for trying this. But this is what's happening. We're going from a sort of a copy economy of selling copies of songs or movies or selling access to a usage and sharing economy. In other words, it's a lot easier for a record company to sell a physical product or a download on iTunes than to sell a bundle to the ISP. For example, you're going online and, and saying, okay, as soon as I'm online, I actually have authority to use music. That would make a lot of sense. But it's a whole different economy. I call this content 2.0. Of course, somebody has to invent the name of that sort, 2.0 something or the other. But we do end up with this. Right? We have, we are sitting in the middle of this huge amount of information, entertainment, data, and this is just increasing, just going completely crazy. We are now, as a user, in the center of this. No longer is the television or the actual creator in the center, but I'm in the center. And of course, I'm preaching to the choir here because that is obviously true. But what are these people wondering now that make TV shows or books? They wonder how to reach the people formerly known as consumers. They were so easy to reach a long time ago. How to maintain the value. How to make sure people keep coming back. What to give away and what to sell. It's a whole debate about streaming for free versus downloads. I mean, we're talking about all these questions of content owners saying how not to be commoditized. How not to turn into air? We don't pay for air, but we do pay for electricity and for water. And we pay a lot. We pay always more, too. Bottled water is the biggest business growing 17% a year worldwide. Bottled water. We could use a very similar approach to media. Some of that water feels like free, but a lot of it is purchased voluntarily, essentially. I mean, you can drink the water from the tap here if you wanted to, but you voluntarily buy other water. So we have this trend of control moving down where it was with the content owners and creators moving into the user. This is good for us as users, but as companies that have content, this is quite a painful experience. All of a sudden, music consumers are saying, you know what, I find other ways of doing this. I don't need you. You're outmoded. And this is happening everywhere. So. This is a trend that I call sort of the new content ecosystem. I put this together from a stuff I stole from Google Images, or I borrowed from Google Images. We have a new content ecosystem. And this is what's happening this year. Content players will connect with search engines, portals, social networks, and telecoms to figure out the new deal. This is going to be a good thing for a lot of people. Because ultimately, it's the telecoms and the networks that make that final connection. This is what we're going to see this year, starting in 2009, total convergence of telecom and web layers. There's no way the telecoms can do without content. Because their phone calls and data calls and all that is getting cheaper by the minute. Especially in Asia, when you have competition. In fact, most of that will be free. So they're forced to actually intersect with web portals, players, social networks, content providers. And vice versa, Google now, for example, is actually forced, in a way, to talk to the telecoms about how they can actually use that intersection of those two places, the web and telecom. So deep collaboration becomes the key requirement. No longer is dominance the key requirement. No longer can you win the war, so to speak, for the customer by shooting missiles. Right. You'll have to find another way to convince them. So the over-the-top layers, you know, search, social media, 
sharing must come down, telecoms must move up. So if in the telecom business you have this, uh, if this layer on top is basically not really connected, Facebook sits on top of the mobile phone system, but they don't share the data plan. Data plan comes from somewhere else. Right? Mobile phone providers don't provide content, but they provide the data, and then you, you have to worry about the content, how you ship it back and forth. Right? These things are going to have to completely converge. And that's where I see a huge amount of opportunity. Because in the end, it's about mutual benefits that are being created here. So, moving on in this direction, all of a sudden, we have these formally separated business entities, entertainment, con telecom, advertising, content, and of course, search. Now, it's, what's happening is this, it's all being jumbled up. I'm sure you're quite familiar with that. Right? All of a sudden, advertising is something where telecoms have to think about. Content providers have to talk about advertising and telecoms. Right? It's all converging in a way that makes quite a mess. Just like uh, you know, the role change that we have to go through. Right? From the pirate to a, to a playboy to whatever, this is happening like Johnny Depp, you know, that's pictured here, happening all the time to all of us and of course, worst case for the telecoms. Telecoms all of a sudden have to think about content. Right? They had no consideration of that until just a few years ago. Now the mobile phone will be the biggest device for content and communications, much bigger than anything we've seen on the computer. Even in America, it will just take a little bit longer. So that trend you're seeing, and finally we have this thing on a television, where the television used to be all about content and quality, both of content as well as on, of course, the image and the projection. Now it's all about this, time shifting, place shifting, feeds, community, folksonomy, remixing. And you have stuff like these widgets that will show up on your television screen. Any of you been to the uh, Consumer Electronics Show? That was a big thing about this stuff this year. All the television having widgets at the bottom. Internet connected televisions. Not IPTV, but just connected to the web with your Facebook icons, the Google Reader, Gmail, all at the bottom of the screen. This is a whole different cup of tea. All of a sudden, our televisions are smart. They can do these things. Become something my grandmother can do. Click on her Facebook widget. That's when we're going to see mass adoption. So now is the question, who controls what here? In the old world, television essentially was the center and the television controlled what we could see. When and how we could see it. And of course, all the money was made there as well. The money was made by the TV guys. Right, but the people offering it, the cable television, the producers, the networks. Now the money is sort of centered around the user. All of a sudden it has shifted from the owner of the content to the user of the content. Right. That is a huge shift that still would take quite a bit of time to figure out how to actually turn that around into a new business model. But this is the key question, who owns what? If somebody creates secondary, what I call meta content, by rating, tagging, forwarding, sharing, Facebooking, whatever you want to call it. Who owns that? A week ago, Facebook had a huge clash about this issue. Who owns that content? Should I own it because I made it? Should they own it because they run the platform? Right. This is, of course, a rather academic question. In the end, everybody knew that the content was essentially public domain in a way. Right? And Facebook, of course, retracted, which was actually a very, very smart move. But this kind of scenario, ultimately, who has the say about this? I think this question will recede as an important question. What happens ultimately is, uh, what is what happens collectively is what matters most, because that is basically where the sense of it all is. Blogs individually are useless. Blogs as a total are huge. And so if you take a couple of really important blocks, of course they are important, but in the aggregate it's really important what happens in block, not in the individuality of 100,000 users. So part of my book is talking about the sharing economy. And not to be too Californian or sort of as uh, some record company called it, you know, cyber professor thinks, right? We're basically crawling like a snail into the sharing economy because that is what you see all around us is the idea of sharing the output. So what I put out, I publish, I remix, I co-create, I live stream my stuff, and that's basically exhibitionism in a way, right? to where I show what I do to everyone, 
especially as an artist or a creator, but I share the output, but I also share the input, i.e. I get money, attention, reputation. Why are there tens of thousands of people reviewing books on Amazon for free? They get paid with attention. They get something back. Why do people do Wikipedia? Why do they comment on a blog? They have an other non-monetary benefit, which is just as valuable to them. Uh, that's why you blog, of course, to begin with. And then, of course, this is the Google topic, sharing the throughput, the usage data, the meta content, the attention, what I call the data economy. All of these things create money. Not only create value, but also create money. And to me, ultimately, if you take a combination of the streams, output, input, and throughput, you end up with a new way of how this could work. But not by yourself. If you're CNN or News Corp, you don't get to do all these things. You do one of them. You have the output that gets paid for. That is going to be a lot harder in the future just to have one of them. It's important to have all three of them. So, looking at what's happening here from the days of the printing press, you know, they essentially gave birth to copyright. The printing press came up and eventually we ended up with the statute of Anne, which was in the UK, saying these publishers have the right, nobody else does. That's how we got to copyright in a you know, very basic way. Now on the internet, it gives birth to what I call sharing rights or usage rights. That's the situation that we're in right now. Under what circumstance do I share and let other people use? Google made a deal with the book publishers, the Authors Guild, gave them some money and a revenue share, right? So the deal is obviously a give and take. It cannot just be a take, like in the music business. It takes so much that there's nothing left of the business. Uh, that doesn't work. So that's the trend that we're seeing in the, in the sort of old economy where it was quite simple. We had the content. If you want the content, you pay. You want the music, you pay. You want the books, you pay. You want the television, you pay. You just pay. And then you get. It was a very simple equation. Because there was no way for us to get without paying. Well, there was a way, but, you know, subverting cable television with a box in the basement is not a job for everyone. So we had to pay. That was a quite straightforward thing. It was great for Hollywood because we had to pay to get, resulting in a lot of really happy producers. Because right? this was a very straightforward equation. Now, of course, now it looks like this as Chris Anderson, I call him free wired long tail as a nickname, because that's what he likes to talk about. It's right down the street. He says, the same consumers are saving their money playing free online games, canceling cable, watching free video, killing their landlines in favor of Skype. Everything is free and 100% off. Of course, that is his view on the drasticness of this. But there's a lot of things that are quite true about this. If we watch the trends and what's happening, and of course, a lot of people when I work in the content business, they say to me, Google has been the most successful in making things free. Of course, that's true, but how does it come out on the other end? The control button is declining and we're, we're creating opportunities out of this. So back to the image of the TV guy, this person now is becoming the center of our undertaking. The person who's using, I wouldn't call consuming, using or co-creating, that person becomes essentially the controlling entity. Of course, that's a theory in most businesses now. Right? But what does it really mean in terms of ownership and control? and these things. Take a look at Skype. I'm sure you, most of you are Skype users, right? It's 245 million of them, there must be some here. So Skype has said, okay, free gets my attention. Free Skype, but they upsell about 5 to 8 percent of their users to all these things. I'm sure you have like Skype out or a phone number or the mobile diversion or so. So bottom line is free gets the attention, merit and trust gets the money. And so if we bring it down to the bottom line of what's happening is a lot of free things are designed to bring me in and other things are designed to convert me into payment. Google offers all these free tools. Are we still here? No. Okay. Do we have sound? Okay. I'm forced to the podium. Like I almost feel like a preacher. I guess there's a, there a parallel there, I guess, in some way. Should I stay here then? Uh, the only thing you're going to do is put it, you're going to put it on some 
button, no? Nope. No, that's okay. I'll stay here. Don't worry about it. Stick with the podium. It's not such a bad place to be after. But the payment is, is more if, if you're actually a preacher. In any case, so free gets my attention, but merit and trust is what gets my money. Right? And there is quite a difference in that. I mean, if you're looking at what's happening uh, in that context, that's actually quite a tall mission to make things free and then collect the money. Is it working in terms of the sound? OK. So now consumers, and this is some great research that is from a universal mechanic. If you go to the website, you can download it. It says, on the influence revolution, the customer is now dictating. I mean, dictating in the sense of dictatorship, basically. I mean, this is a whole different cup of tea where all of a sudden, in the old days, you know, it was essentially the pre-media age, the church and the state would do it, and then the professionals would do it, and now we do it. Right? The dictating of the customer, and you know, again, with the Facebook thing just a week ago, we could, say, we could actually see how that works. Right? We dictate that Facebook can't do this. Maybe it was all a publicity idea, I don't know, but it worked out well, that's for sure. So the recent efforts there, you know, by, the, by changing the terms of use, you know, that did not work out for Facebook. So basically that was flipped upside down. And that is just an example of, you know, what we're heading into is what I call the new content economy. Right? So we're taking the content in the middle, but we're no longer actually making payments to get it. And we're also, of course, as the users, creating our own content. We're essentially moving from the, from the corners into the middle as well. Because all of a sudden, I'm, I'm like annotating content, forwarding it, sharing it. Uh, that's a whole different cup of tea. And so here, I'm moving into a situation to where I make the payment as part of a freemium deal, for example, like Flickr does. You know, I get free streaming for music, but then I pay $10 to download the live concert. Right? So that creates money as a consequence, not as a requirement. So these kind of ideas, of course, they're floating all over the place. I want to focus on a few of them in this, in this talk. But, you know, for example, iPhone apps like Pink. Right? The iPhone app is free, but if you want the elaborate version, you can pay and get more. So that's the same model. The money is basically a consequence. Uh, for example, Kite has a sim very similar model. It's basically free, but lots of people convert. The gaming business has been doing this very successfully, like Club Penguin. You know, 28% of the users convert to the next level. They pay voluntarily, so to speak, after they get for free. Advertising, of course, the same thing. You know, their money is a consequence of my attention. And of course, most importantly, the network, the internet itself. Right? The money is not an entry fee to the internet, is what happens in the end when I use. That's how I get paid. Now we'll get into detail on this particular example. So what we're seeing here is in this sort of what I call the new content economy is that once I, I, I show people that I have value and that I have merit, I sort of am like a magnet, you know, I bring people to my content. Right? And then from there, I essentially gather attention from people. And then I have two options. I call it third party pays or I pay. Those are the two basic options. Right? Third party pays means somebody else pays for me to use because they want my attention as well. Used to be called advertising or marketing or affiliates or as a hundred names or or a product placement or whatever you want to call it, right? But this is crucial because if you're always coming back to one point to where you're saying you pay or I pay, that is a very limited approach now because ultimately you end up in a situation where lots of people are saying there's other ways to get what you're offering. Music is a great example. So this, of course, has interaction as well between attention, value, and merit. But in our really new content economy is based on the tension essentially looking like this. You know, if we take the third-party payment approach and the I-payment approach, after that, there's a whole slew of things that is being diverted, for example, advertising, data usage, affiliates, that is a third-party payment. And where I pay, I have premiums, I have user-made content, sharing, and bundles. These are only some of the models. For example, in the I-pay model, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to think that if the internet service provider has a license for content, as soon as I buy the deal for the DSL, the content is included. This is already in place in 10 countries around the world. In Denmark, when you sign up for TDC, which is a big telco, the music is free. Download, stream, whatever you want, as long as you have the ISP, music is free. In China, Google, which is top 100 in China, 
has made a deal with about 30,000 artists. You may not know about this, but essentially when you use the search engine, top 100, then you can listen and download all that stuff for free. That is the logic behind, you know, so I pay a little bit because I pay with attention, but third parties pay. Right? This is a very crucial shift. So we're, we're seeing essentially the user also becoming content. There's been a study by Nokia saying they expect about 35% of all of the content on the web to be made by the users in the next five years. So it's a trend away from exclusive ownership of that. For example, with Twitter and the recent disaster in, uh, in New York, the airplane disaster, the first news was, of course, on Twitter. And this is my Twitter wheel. It's called Twitter wheel. You should try it. It's pretty cool. You can, you can figure out who on Twitter is how connected to you through what people. Right? So essentially, the users are the content here. All of a sudden, the user actually is money. It goes back to what we called the internet bubble you know, 10 years ago, to where the audience seemed to be all that matters, not how it generates money. Huh? But this essentially is a way sort of back into this. And that's, I think, somewhere in there is where the cash register is that we have to discover exactly how that works. But let's go back to this. Kevin Kelly made this image, which I really liked. This shows the, the situation currently on the web. Everything that people do on the web is a copy. Every click, every button creates a copy on some server, on some computer, some mobile phone. Right? So when I go to publishers or record labels, I say, look, every listening is a copy. Every public performance is a copy. It blows up, of course, the whole legal system of how you get paid. Right? Because that system doesn't really fit anymore. We have to figure out how we can actually make money with the music or other content that's being put onto the network. I think Google needs to be involved in making free content legal and monetizable. Well, legal, of course, is less of a concern because you know, it is a concern to the lawyers. But in terms of the economics, it doesn't make money just by being legal. Right? So, now figuring out how to actually make it monetizable, that is a, that's a major opportunity. And this collaborates, of course, with the telcos, with the content owners, last not least, right? but of course also with social networks and advertising. So we're going to see the situation in a sort of a real connected scenario. This is not something that one company can solve. MySpace isn't going to solve this problem for music just because it's MySpace. You know, this is a larger story. So if we're looking at the, uh, at the sort of projection for the future I have, you know, I think the traditional content models of selling copies are looking like this. Uh, we can see this clearly with music. 25% drop every year. Some countries like Korea, 98% drop. It's no more selling CDs because they have really high powered bandwidth. Right? So all of a sudden, selling copies is no longer an option. If you, sell, if you try to sell copies now, especially, of course, in music, but to a lesser degree in games or in software, all these things are heading in the right direction. It's a different story for movies because it's not quite everybody doing it. But we're seeing this essentially in a trend that converts into copies going down, but most and more importantly is what I call attention-based revenues going up. Right? That is the key to the future of monetizing people's creations. People pay attention. When I, when I turn the attention into money, that's where the new money comes from. Of course, that model is old. You know, it's television and radio, basically. right? I mean, television used to tell us, you watch for free, but we take your eyeballs, sell them back to the advertisers. The very same thing is going to happen on the mobile phone, using search, using streaming, using social networking. Our qualified eyeballs being sold back to people who like to meet us for some reason or the other commercial meeting in the sense of advertising, but also otherwise. So that is the phase where we're in right now. Can this generate money? Well, global advertising is $750 billion. Music business is $27 billion. Would it be possible to pay for all of music with advertising? Easy. Why is it not happening? Well, obviously, there's no permission. Right? So we're getting down to the question of deciding that there has to be an agreement to actually do this. But the contest industries are going from this idea. This is a photo from Switzerland, by the way, um, where everything is forbidden. Going from everything being forbidden, right? Well, that's actually not true. It's a really nice country to live in for all the Swiss people watching this video. Um, so the, the content owners are, have to go from this, from this no idea to the yes idea. I mean, if you go to a copyright society, performing rights organization, you want to license a streaming on-demand service, they still to this day say, we don't know how to deal with you. This is like 10 years old now. And how come there isn't a legal way to do this? They just say no, and that's it. 
artists don't get paid, we can't do it. Thousands of companies trying to get a license, there is no such thing. So it's not rocket science or futurism to point at this as being an obvious solution. So what I call content 2.0 is a basic, very basic principle, and that goes for books as well as it does for music and videos. Make it available, get users addicted. I mean, we're talking about addiction when we talk about all the cool stuff like Facebook. I mean, there is officially Facebook addiction right, as a syndrome. Right? And the same pretty soon for Twitter, I would suppose, or even for the Google feeder. So then you sell everything around and up from the content. Right? That is, of course, an old idea, getting somebody to actually like something and then sell up from there. And Kevin Kelly says, when copies are free, you need to sell things that can't be copied. That's, of course, a bitter pill for, for creators because they think that the copy actually makes the money. Right? That's the sacrosanct idea of copyright. So we have this dilemma. And before I do this, I want to point out that you know, for the world out there, I don't want to abolish copyright or any such thing. Right? I'm far from it. I'm just pointing out that if we want to monetize copyright, we're going to have to use a different approach. We have this issue that both the idea of copy and right is completely eroded by reality. I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just saying what is. Right? So we have copies on the internet, we have people networking, we have uh, mobile computers being given to people for free, and there are copy machines, obviously. We have everybody being a broadcaster, iPhone apps that share, the Pirate Bay exploding. Right? I mean, this basically it's copy going crazy. And when broadband wireless internet comes to the mobile devices, this is going to be at times a thousand. Go to Korea, then you can see the future of copying. People sitting in the subway sharing like two, uh, two gigabyte of files as they're driving on the train together, movies or whatever it is. So we can go and we can say, okay, we have the right, the law is on our side, which of course it is. We have good lawyers, you know, we have judges, we can put people to jail, you know, we have all these people protecting your rights, we can disconnect people, but in the end, you know, all end up in the same place. Everybody's copying. We end up with this, where the whole world is connected, but the law still says they can't. Because you realize this as the Google conundrum to, to a large degree, right? Because you facilitate, of course, the finding of that. And in this mission, we have a real dilemma in that what we can learn from the music industry is basically the focus on control is not profitable. And this is happening around the world in content businesses. Look at the file sharing sites. I mean, they're exploding. People are now uh, objecting all this stuff. Apple has taken over the music business because of this. Next is Nokia that wants to take it over. Right? And still, we're looking at a downward trend. So if you're looking for a, a profitable business, you know, control isn't the way to do it. And that is slowly becoming clear to a lot of content owners you know, that are basically being perceived to be shaking out the money from people as a consequence. The most hated company in America in 2007 was the, was the RAA, the Recording Industry Association of America. Even that's before Halliburton, the people who make the bombs. Right? The RAA was the most hated company in America. So that was the result of the control campaign of downloading. So the alternative, of course, to control is really trust. That sounds sort of like a fishy way of saying things because trust is sort of ephemeral in a way, it's just sort of out there. Trust really is something where we can say, okay, Paulo Coelho makes his books away, uh, available, not all of them, but quite a few of them, on his site called piratecoelho.com. Right? And he trusts people to actually go, T-Mobile and uh, Deutsche Telekom has a new program called Lives for Sharing. I mean, what, what are they sharing? Mobile phones are sharing content, right? somebody else's content. And of course, Google Attitude is about sharing. Right? The value is in the sharing, right? it is not in the keeping. So I think protect, protecting our creations is a mission impossible that does not make money in the protection. So what does, you know, this basically, if you look at these nice dogs, which I got from somewhere on the web, I, I wish I knew where, but anyway, anybody who has this can let me know about this. But I think trust is based on attention and if I can take people's attention, get their trust, I can convert that into money again. Kevin Kelly says, wherever attention flows, money will follow. If we take this as a business paradigm, I think we're pretty well advised, wherever attention flows, money will follow. Right? And this sounds very much like a, like a you know, dot-com bubble idea, right? But it's not. We're seeing this happening everywhere. 
And we're seeing this happening even in the car industry now. Revenues are a consequence of attention. Of course, if you can't convert it, then you have another problem. You know, that's, that's, a, uh, that's the next step of it. So what's wrong with this picture? Looking at the music industry, free falling, right, while the entire US online paid content spending, eMarketer says, is increasing. What's wrong with this picture? How come people are spending money for online content but not on music? Right? Or not on other stuff that the content owners want to sell them? They're spending it on dating. Right? That's also con called content. Right? Or software, or of course research reports, or games. Right? Or Flickr for that matter. Right? They're, they're spending it on other stuff. How, how come not on music? I mean something is wrong in the offering. So also when we see this from the uh, a great report from the IBM uh, Business Institute uh, saying how the content industry, digital content market is exploding. I mean, the numbers are here. What do we need to do to get people's money with this? We need to find a way that we can attract their attention and then convert them, not keep their attention down. So this is the whole idea of making money with trust. You know, a victim of too much control clearly is Rhapsody, for example. Anybody know Rhapsody music? Fantastic. 755,000 subscribers. That's like, what is that? It's like uh, the amount of, of taxi drivers in Jakarta. You know, it's nothing. Right? And then, uh, you know, this doesn't work because all the stuff that we're being asked to do, which including Windows Media, of course, isn't going to work. Right? This is a complete idea of saying, okay, and this is basically what the consumer has been saying. The consumer has been saying, I'm not part of this. I'm not interested. So that is a trend that you see everywhere, and now this sort of, you know, I think 2009 is the year where we finally can say goodbye to this idea, right, that we can make more money with control. Um, and of course, I think that's pretty much good for everyone, except for the interim pains that we're going to see in going from the old to the new. So the real question is, how do we actually bridge this? Right? How do we get from the old to the new? Because we know pretty much what the new is, but, you know, where's the money in the new? So the bridging job is a, a tough gig, you know, going from the control island to the trust island, as, as I call it, right? This, of course, sorry, this is some of the companies who are in this turf. Um, Google, Amazon, Wikipedia, Volvo, you know, the safe car, eBay, and so on. Many other people are looking at how to do this, how to bridge from one to the other and generate new values. So I think it's a huge opportunity is to take this and what I call basically saying uncorking the trust economy. Now taking this, what people are saying that if they trust me, then I can actually get the benefits and make and pulling out the cork and making that work and saying now Google of course is a leader in this very same idea of, of uncorking the trust, which probably isn't entirely an easy mission in many cases. I'm going to skip this because I I do need to come and wrap up because I don't want you to spend your entire day with me. Um, I'll give you an example. You know, I was in a place in London the other day. I love sushi. Oh, this is not what it's supposed to be. This place is called Inamo. Okay, Inamo has fantastic sushi, of course. That that is a given in London. Not as good as sushi round, though. Just kidding. But in any case, this place has electronic surface. Uh, computers where you can change the color of the table, you can order through the system, and you can do this whole experience. So you can even look at the chef with the video camera, and you can play Battleship if you want. If your dinner date is boring, you can play Battleship. Right? So why do people go there? Because the content, which is a sushi, of course is great, but the package is even better. It's the experience. Right? So that teaches us a lot about content. It's the experience that will get more payment, not in all cases, but in some cases, than the actual thing inside. I go there because it's, it's just an experience. How long will it last? Well, I don't know, but you know, this place is not booked for the next six months or something. So it's an interesting uh, lesson to how you can wrap content. Now we're actually going to get to see some of these things, but I recommend you check it out and stuff, because it teaches a lot about content. You know, why do people go there and how they do this? So the content economics that I look at are simply like this, and this is influenced by Kevin Kelly uh, and Yoshai Bankler and, of course, Chris Anderson. Uh, basically, is saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to see great momentum in a whole content economy based on trust. 
And of course, I looked this up, trust, and I found Google. This was an interesting thing. Who do you trust? Right? I found in Google we trust, which is kind of a you know, parody, but still, a lot of people think of that as being the prime mechanism behind driving your business. And of course, then we have immediacy. You have a site like Celeband. Right? Celeband is a site in, in, uh, in uh, Holland, now in the UK, where you can donate $50 to a band that you like to finance their new development and basically make a CD in the studio. You are actually the record label. Everybody can contribute. They funded about 35 bands with $50,000 each by the people. Why do they do that? Because they're immediate, they're right next to the band. They're involved. They pay to be involved with the band, to have a direct connection. The other thing is individualization. Last FM. Why do I pay? Well, I'm going to pay for the last FM mobile device application on my Android or whatever because they allow me to individualize. Not because of the music. The music is a given, right? that the music is good. But they make the rapper. So what's wrong, by the way, with saying we'll give last FM a license for this with all the music included and we'll share the license and make a nice rapper that I buy the rapper. It's essentially the next CD. Right? The software on the mobile phone is the next CD. Packaging. Android is a great example, right? I package the content in a different way, and that's why I buy it. Right? It's very much the same than individualization. It's related, of course. Selection and filtering. Hearts of Space, which is a, a, a new age, uh, not a new age, so it's an ambient electronic brand that used to have a great uh, show, anybody knows, on the on radio show on the KPFA. Um, there, if you go to hos.com, you get the selection of the program. That's what you pay for. Yes, you could listen to all that music for free somewhere else, but you pay for the selection, the filter. Right? So this is something that is a very interesting lesson. Convenience. A ringtone. Why do people pay for ringtones? It's convenient. Click with the button, get the ringtone, install it, you're done. Can you make a ringtone on your computer? Yes, you can. You pay $3 for convenience. So these ideas, and of course conversation, as Twitter has shown, people pay for conversation. Of course, they don't pay Twitter quite yet but I think they will. Right? Paying for conversation. So uh, Kevin Kelly points this out in his whole thing on his Technion blog. Right? People pay for these things. This is what he calls new generatives. And anybody can heat this up. We're talking about a trillion dollar uh, entertainment economy. Right? Not just music, but also, of course, eventually the, the hottest topic here is really books. Right? Because books are taking that turn in a whole different way than music ever has. So we see in this trends, and I'm sure you've seen this trends, everything is becoming digital, music becoming video, being sort of on the heels of music, games already there, books taken longer because of the interface issue, magazines and print. CEO of Microsoft says, no media consumption left that's not over IP in 10 years. I, I don't quite believe it that there will be no print or anything, but he does, of course he's Microsoft, he has to believe something. So, what becomes more important there is the filter. Right? Why do I care about 62 million songs? I don't. I need the filter. I'm going to pay for the filter. Right? As Clay Shirky says, is a really smart guy, says, essentially saying that you know, with the overload, it's not information overload, it's filter failure. Right? This is part of the stuff that we're going to see as a lucrative business. So I'm really going to wrap it up. Now I'm going to go to the end. Okay, here's something for you if you're interested in what I think is a great future opportunity for Google. I think the telecoms around the world, if you're looking at calls, SMS, data, content, their amount of control is drastically declining. They can control my calls, my SMS, and to some degree my data, but they can't control my service or my experience or other things that are sort of more ephemeral that are above the network. This is a great opportunity for Google to come in and say, okay, we actually have this overlapping area because Google has no control over my calls, my SMS. But of course, having control over service and experience, this is a different story. Right? And there is overlap here that I think is a very interesting opportunity. So I'm going to wrap it up with a uh, sort of a, uh, a summary. And I think that Hollywood's control crisis is a huge opportunity for everybody else. Because of course they're much more in cases, in many cases, more obsessed with controlling than with actually making money. So we have this idea basically going forward. I think the fight for control was a fight for distribution. The fight for attention 
is essentially a fight for trust. The beneficiaries of control are, were monopolies, uh, as we have observed several times. The beneficiaries of trust are those that collaborate. I think that points the way towards a very interesting future. I think trust should probably be Google's most significant objective, right, because that's what it all comes down to. Thanks very much for listening. You can download the slideshow at mediafuturist.com. Thanks. Oh, I do have some copies of my music book if anybody wants to read about music 2.0 and you know, waste some brain cells, you can get a copy. Thanks very much.